Um, so let me switch gears or kind of shake, shake our heads and say, hey, let's switch gears. And we get back into our conversation. We just started last week. And I think the, you know, sometimes you don't know how important conversations are going to be until you begin to get in and dig into them and begin to say, wow, this is so, such a relevant uh, uh, time. When, we, when I prepare these conversations, they're often six months in advance. We, the conversation is a play on a prefix. And that prefix, as you can see on the screen, is E-N versus I-N. And each week, I'm just going to remind us that the prefix E-N, you can see it on the screen, means to cause to be or to put into a particular state. If we could put that on the, on the screen, that'd be great. Uh, yes, thank you. E-N means to cause to be or to put into a particular state or condition as in endear, ensure, entrust, meaning uh, that when you entrust something, you're causing a trust to happen. Enable, I'm causing something to be able. And so the opposite of that is often with the, the prefix I-N, invisible. That means I'm not being visible. E-N, visible, means we're going to make you visible. So every week we're going to look at the reversal quality, the reversal character of God. How he takes things in our culture and he reverses them. Last week began, we kicked it off with the word inadequate. That when we come as broken human beings and imperfect before a perfect God, we see like Adam did in the garden, Isaiah did when he faced off with God and Peter when he saw Jesus, our inadequacy uh, of, of being in the presence of a perfect God he is a, automatically illuminated. But then God turns that around and makes us adequate to stand before him in Christ. Today, we're going to be talking about instability. Instability. And I couldn't think of a better time, a better word, a better conversation in a, in a time where things have become quite unstable. Now, I think there are two worlds of instability. There's the world that we can control, and there's the world that we can't control. So, for example, if you say, hey, I'm going to start working out at the gym, okay, that's going to be up to you for the most part if you're going to be consistent with that or you're not going to be consistent. I'm going to start reading the Bible more. I'm going to start, you know, uh, eating more kale. Uh, thank you. And, I, and, and we're going to and, and I'm going to be consistent, then it, the challenge, it may be one of the greatest challenges to human beings to be stable, to be consistent. Would you agree? In other words, those habits, it takes such a long time to form a habit where you can have stability in the way that you think and the way that you behave and the, and the things that you're trying to do and the things you're trying not to do and all those things. Those things, for the most part, Outside certain circumstances are things that we can change. However, today, we talk about the world we can't change. There, there are things around us. The directive from God is clear. 1 Corinthians 15 says it this way. Be consistent and be immovable. Now, that's easy to read. It's easy to say. But think about how difficult it is to be immovable and steady in a very movable and changing culture around us. There are so many things that are happening. When we stand before Christ, we hope that we will hear these words, well done, good and consistent servant. I know I switched the word. Faithful means stable, consistent, keeping your hand to the plow. It's not up and down and up and down. So we're going to look this morning at some areas that are beyond our control that are outside, but do impact our, our inside. We see that God is the one that is stable, and therefore we, like we saw last week, inadequacy is good because it makes us cling to a God that makes us adequate. If we could be adequate on our own to stand before God in our own human effort, we would not recognize our inadequacy and we wouldn't need God. 
This is the problem sometimes of living in our culture. It's the problem with having more money, to be honest with you, more fund, more position, more power, because when those things are on the increase, every single person sitting here, every single person watching online, every single one of us would say, it is a challenge that the more strength we have as human beings, the less strength we draw from God. I think about our, our culture and just think about all the different areas that seem to have instability. Let's take the economy. The economy seems to be at a place where it is always always been unstable. We're, we're waiting for the Fed to change the points, to lower the points, to raise the points. Unemployment numbers come at us every single week. Uh, your own personal finances, they may be, and there, there's hardly a place in history where like, well, that was a stable period of time for 20 years economically. The, the economy right now seems uh, stable. Geopolitically, it seems right now that we are at a place geopolitically that has more instability than it has in recent years. I was reading this week about BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, the alliance of, of Brazil and Russia and India and China and South Africa and then other countries that are joining that. And the more I read, the more anxious I became. The more I read about what's happening in our own backyard, Cuba right now, by the way, is collapsing. Their economic, uh, 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 their, ec uh, their economy is colla collapsed. Their, uh, their electric grid is, is collapsed. In fact, our pastor, Julio, uh, pastor of our Spanish ministry, Hispanic ministry, is there now with the caring for his mom, uh, 82 years old. We look at what's happening in Venezuela, and if you read enough uh, Guyana and Bolivia and whatnot, and again, the more you read about this world we can't control, the more geopolitically anxious you'll become. It is a time outside, it seems, outside of our control. I was thinking about theologically, how, uh, what instability. If you just go on Google and say, how many evangelicals do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you will be shocked. How many, just fill in the blank, how many evangelicals no longer believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, you'll be shocked. And some of the greatest uh, leaders, some of the most uh, uh, visible Men in this country, I'll pick on them, uh, that I have followed fanatically, I would say 80% of them have fallen morally, the men that I have followed. Uh, names that I could rattle off right now and you, you'd recognize that there seems to be an instability. When I was out of the country, um, I went to a seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Albert Moeller, you may know that name, may not know that name. Albert Moeller was a, a, a conservative hero who came in and, and saved that seminary. And, and, and he's been there for 31 years. He was announcing in chapel when I was watching him announcing the chapel of another man in the Southern Baptist denomination that was a significant, significant, one of the most significant leaders who, again, in his 70s, confessed that he was in a in moral, adulterous uh, relationship. I could see and feel the weight on Dr. Moeller's face. And he said, has this increased in our age? Because it seems that way. And he said, I'm not sure that it's increased, but what has happened in our culture is that one second after the news is public, it is viral. So part of the anxiety that we experience is because of news media and, and social media and things become instant news around the world. I say that because it raises our anxiety. I've been following the, the, the unsettling of the nation of Bangladesh. Okay, 50 years ago, most people don't even know where Bangladesh is. But now it's in our face, it's on the front news, and this all adds to our sense of instability. I could go on and on and on, even on a personal level. 
There's instability, as we're going to see, in relationships. People that used to be your fans are now people that don't like you at all. People that are friends are unfriending you. People that, are, that, that we have gotten to in such a short fuse culture that even sometimes the closest friendships, we live in a skeptical world where we think, I wonder how long this friendship is going to last. Politicians are always promising a better life. So the, the landscape is not positive. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next time. <laughs> That seems terribly downer, right? Thank you, Steve, for just ruining my week. <laughs> but here's the beauty, as we saw the beauty of inadequacy, here's the beauty of instability. The beauty of instability is that amongst every dimension and angle of instability, there is what, we, what is revealed and illuminated and accentuated and amplified is that it causes us to hold on to the only thing, the only one who is stable, and that is the living God. So the instability, the more things get unstable, universal sign for unstable, the more we like, I need you, God. What if everything were like completely stable? I promise you, I know you because I know me you would need God less in your mind. If everything were just even kill, you would need God less in your mind. I, I look at this verse probably one of my favorite verses to send people in turmoil. In fact, I sent this verse during the hurricanes to several people. And post-hurricane, you will keep, speaking of God, in perfect peace, him whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts in you. I would keep that verse in my back pocket at all times. Because there is some responsibility for us that even in an unchanging or ch a very changing, unstable world, one thing that we can change is our own personal fix on God. Nobody can take that away. They couldn't take it away from Joseph when he was in prison. They couldn't take it away from Paul when he was in prison. They couldn't take, they, no one, no matter how unstable this world takes, they can't reach in and take you the fix of God out of your life. We are stayed on you. The three areas that I think you'll relate to here that we're going to talk about. Um, feelings, which can be very unstable. Uh, forgiveness, which can be very unstable. And the future. They all start with F. You're welcome. Just kidding. Most of you know I just took a sabbatical. Um, two days before my sabbatical, I received some news that wasn't that great. Everybody in this room, everybody watching knows what that knows what kind of feeling that is. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's a loss, sometimes it's health, sometimes it's a relational. Just you know, it, you have yours, I got mine. I'm not up here to share you know, my personal, you know, peaks and valleys. But those are the moments, you know, when you sometimes get news. And, and I don't know about you. I'll just confess. I, laying awake in the middle of the night, somewhere around 3 a.m. is the worst. And it seems like, you know, things are amplified. Noises are amplified. Emotions are amplified. And you're like, okay, I'm going to set that aside and just like a bad cold, it keeps coming back. I'm going to set it aside, it keeps coming back. And our emotions, the things outside of us that are beyond us. Some of you are going through that right now, post-hurricane. You're wondering, where in the world are we going to live? Can we still live here? Can we still do this? Do we need to move? How are we going to afford the back fence? How are we going to afford... You know, whatever that thing is, uh, what's happening with our business, what's happening with our... So many questions. I've talked to so many people uh, post-hurricane. 
And look, we can look each other in the eye and say, I get it. We get it. You get it. I get it. One of the things, you know, people ask me, hey, what great revelation did you have, um, you know, um, when you when you're on sabbatical? You know, it's, it's, you know, the anticipation almost it's almost uh, it causes anxiety. Like I've got to come up with some great revelation, you know. So number one, eat more kale. That's uh, as I keep trying to tell you people. And the news that came to me was so unsettling that I, it was actually good for me. Because the instability caused, caused me to reach out to a stable God. And, um, and in that, three little words, which seemed so simple that you were like, hmm, kind of hoping for a little something deeper. And the three words that kept coming to me is this, God is good. Now, that seems to be like, okay, and we're kind of looking for something new here. <laughs> but, okay, I'm going to be I'm gonna be super honest with you with one of my challenges. I'm type A. I, you know, I may seem calm right now, but I'm like a little fiery duck. My little feet are going underneath the water all the time. And there are some times when I'm on mission, I'm doing something, and something's gone wrong, or I get a report, I'm, I'm like, Really, God, I'm on, you know, I'm on mission. I'm trying to do here, and really the flight's delayed or blah, blah, blah. The luggage is lost. I can't believe this is happening. Ever been there? Please say yes. (laughs) And to come with to grips with no matter what happens, God cannot be ungood. Regardless of where things fall, what's happening, all of these things. God is in just at his very nucleus. Good. Some reminders. Psalm 145, 9. And this is kind of the verse that just penetrated me. The Lord is good to every single person on this planet. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on every single person that he has made. No one is an exempt to the goodness of God. Oh, well, that doesn't belong to me. I've done this and this and this and this and this. It doesn't belong. No. God is good to all that he makes. Now watch the stability of his goodness. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from God, from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation and shadow due to change. It's so interesting that James uses shadows because, you know, astronomically, things are always moving. Sun's always moving, earth's always moving, planets moving, winds moving, trees moving, everything. Everybody's moving. God's children are all moving. We're all moving. And therefore, shadows never stay at the same place. This is the, this is the season in Florida, I don't know about you, but our garage door doesn't shut because the sun comes right in that little camera thing. And it's so frustrating that we have to go, someone has to go and stand in front of the thing to, to be the steady shadow in the midst of everything. So you have to Block the, you know, the, sometimes the trees are blowing, blah, blah, and block it and be that sturdy thing so the thing operates right. We need a, sta- a steady shadow in which we can hide. And since everything else is moving, what the Bible is saying is there's only one thing that's not moving. There's only one person that's not moving, and that's God. Amen. And that's, that is something that we can't. Watch this, Psalm 34, verse 8. You try it out. That's what the writer is saying. You try it out. You try God out. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man, watch, who takes refuge in him. I was reading this thing. I brought some notes. Biologists have long recognized the concept of what's called the adversity, adversity principle. That every living thing does not do well when you subtract adversity. So their example is 
zoo animals. Zoo animals just sit around and wait for someone to throw them a head of cabbage or something. They don't have to go hunt anymore. They don't, and so what do they do? They lay around and yawn. I don't enjoy going to see a, to, to a zoo, to be honest with you, anymore. You know, I think there's a bear in there, and he's like, yeah, he's, he's over in the corner, like, you know, waiting for, you know, some kind of cabbage or lettuce or whatever they feed bears. Small children. <laughs> That's not funny. Trees in the rainforest fall down easier because they, got, they have so much water. But this article points out the mesquite tree, which grows in these arid places where there's no water, and the roots are forced to go 30 feet down to find the water. Instability is good for us because it causes our roots to desperately reach down to the goodness of God and taste and see that his goodness does not change. And that is so critically, critically important for us. Finally, before we leave this, the psalmist wrote this, David, in Psalm 27, I would have despaired unless, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Some of you are stressed out, perhaps freaked out by what's happening today and maybe tomorrow. And God gives to us a sense of stability, but you have to keep your eyes stayed on him. Taste and see. you got to get close to taste things. Taste and see that the Lord is good. One more. I, send, I say what I'm about to say sensitively. Our country, in many ways, is over-medicated. Sometimes by alcohol, sometimes by stress relievers, etc. And I'm not downplaying the, the need for medication at times when needed, etc. But we are one nation under God. And if we're not under God, we are going to over-medicate. That medication can be different things. I have over-medicated at times with food. It's been my stress release. Rather than turning to God, it can be anything. It can be sports for you. It can be TV. It can be entertainment. It can be a lot of things. And when I find myself over-medicating with whatever that fix is, it comes to me just being straight up with you so you don't feel like I'm any different than you or any more sacred than you. We all struggle with this. And when we are at our most anxious moments, we do a test and see if we are fixed on God. Because if we're fixed on God, I promise you, that, that stress and that anxiety will lower because he is a God that doesn't change. Amen. God is good. Here's the second thing. The forgiveness of God. And I'll just kind of go through this quickly because I think it's so fundamental, but I believe that somebody needs to hear this. Even as Christians, we have those moments where we've blown it. There's that darn bad habit again. We've fallen prey to it, whatever that thing is. I could give, could give you the overwhelming statistics, one of, of pornography. I could give you the, which captures, which over uh, takes people in such a habitual thing that the, the, the majority, I can say, of men, the majority of men are, have this as a challenge and it brings on deep, deep, deep guilt. And there can become a point in time where you ask yourself, does God forgive me? Listen, listen carefully. God's forgiveness is always available. Human beings' forgiveness is not. It should be. And sometimes we equate the forgiveness of human beings with the forgiveness of God, and they're 1,400 gajillion light years different. We're, we're uh, conditional people. Watch this. 
if we confess our sins, God is stable. (laughs) He is faithful. He is consistent. He's just, and he will. Not maybe, not might, not if you do this, that, and the other, not if you're religious. He will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. How stable can you get there? It's impossible for his forgiveness to change. Watch, the steadfast, the consistent, the stable love of the Lord, it never stops. I don't have anything that doesn't stop. I got a toaster oven now that, you know, the dial, you turn the dial, you put a piece of pizza in, you turn the dial, it stops. The the dial stops. The heater doesn't stop. It looks like a s'mores. You come back, it looks like a s'mores you left in the campfire about two hours too long. Like, wow, that's a golf ball. It used to be a piece of pizza. <laughs> it stops. Everything stops except this, except God. It never comes to an end. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great, God, is your stability. Great is your faithfulness. Watch this. First John chapter 2. If anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Watch, the proof of God's unending forgiveness is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has proven that he's come back from the dead, and he stands before God the Father in our defense, our greatest attorney, our greatest advocate. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Somebody needs to hear that today. God has given up on you. He can't. God won't forgive you. Not in his mix. He's asking us to come and be confident. Here's the final thing. Let's talk about the future. We're in an election year, if you didn't notice. I hope that after November the 5th, Tuesday, If they could just give us one more week of commercials. I was just like, man, that'd be so awesome. I'm going to write a letter to the TV say, just one more week. I mean, we, we haven't quite had enough, right? Government is important. Government is important. Even though we... The statistic is that 40% of politicians, what they promise is actually comes to, to happen. Now, there's complex reasons why that, because we live in a, a system where there's checks and balances, thank God. But let me just put a, a little insert here. And uh, I, yesterday I voted, I voted early. It went smooth. I was so proud of our system and they're very, and you can take a deep breath Historically in our church, I'm not going to get up and tell you how to vote, but I'm going to tell you to vote. The percentage of Christians that don't vote, evangelicals who stand strongly on certain values, stay at home. That's because sometimes we can lose hope in the system and personalities and all that that mess. I've never voted for a personality. I vote for values. And, and I would say to you, please, represent your values and represent the Lord in getting to the polls, okay? I'm not going to tell you who to vote for or anything. I'll, I'll tell you my personal opinion if you come and you want to talk about it, but I'm not going to do it here in a captive audience, and I think most people appreciate that. Um, but what I would say is that any system. What the Bible says is that we are to honor the government. And I know that's tough at times. I know that. But no government equals anarchy. And if we are to vote our values through not only, you know, political figures, but also amendments and all those things are so, so important. There are some things that are political. There are some things that are biblical, by the way. And unfortunately, we've made biblical issues uh, political. Euthanasia is not a political issue. It's a biblical issue. That God is the only one that controls life. Sanctity of life, sanctity of marriage didn't start with politicians. It started with the word of God. And so for me, regardless of the, the politician, 
our conversations about sanctity of life are ridiculous in this country. Six weeks, six months. The Bible says anything after one second is, is late term. So God knows us in the womb. Now, for those of you who have experienced that, the pain of that, I, I say that compassionately. Let me remind you, God's forgiveness and mercy is new every morning. But for me, I, I'm not going to get political. I don't see it in the scripture. I don't see Daniel in Babylon holding a sign. I don't see Paul in, you know, holding a sign in Rome, Nero's got to go or something. You know. <laughs> yeah, Nero's a zero. That's even better. I'm using that second service. <laughs> <laughs> Come up here. I don't know. What am I doing up here? But there are values that are in the scripture that we just can't confuse. Listen, our future is not in the hands of politicians. Our politicians are in the hands of God. Amen. That's that's from the Bible. Amen. God, Numbers twenty three, is a man is not a man that he should lie. There's a distinction between God and human beings. God cannot lie, nor a son of man, that he should change his mind. He's stable. He's stable. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I say, let's vote for Jesus. <laughs> you know it's going to come true, right? What he predicts. Watch this. Isaiah 46. God says, what I have said, that I will bring about. When people get all upset and eager about what's happening in the Middle East, I'm like, we are right on schedule. God hasn't left the universe. He said, what I said will happen is going to happen. What I have planned that I will do. How do we know that? Because Colossians 1, he is before all things and in God and no one else all things hold together. This country, this region, this hemisphere, this world, this planet, this universe, and even your shoes right now, God's holding them together. And for that, I'm very thankful because mine are getting ready to fall apart. We end with this, guys. Listen, who do we have that's been around for so long? There is stability that often comes with history. You can trust people that have had history here. That's why I celebrate the fact that we've been here 18 years. It means something. The loyalty and the faithfulness of those that started and have continued says a lot about character. Watch this. In the beginning, none of us can say that in the beginning, oh Lord, you're the one that laid the foundations of this whole place. Guys, that's a lot of history. Oh Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens of the works of your hands. They're going to perish, but you're going to remain. This whole operation is going to go away, guys. There's no reason to be eager because God will remain. This whole operation is going to wear out like a garment. I'm, yeah. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But God, you remain the same and your years will never end. I'm putting my trust in a God that is good that forgives every single second of every day, and the future is solidly in his hands. Our God is stable. Don't be anxious for anything. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. In fact, thank you for instability in this world because it causes us to hold tightly to the only one who is stable. Thank you, Father, that you are a God of reversal. You are a God of contrast. You are a God that is so far beyond our experience of instability, whether it's the future, our relationships, forgiveness, all those things. 
So, Father, today, I pray, we pray together as a body of Christ, specifically for those who right now are suffering anxiety, who are suffering eagerness, who are suffering uh, worry, that, that your Holy Spirit would kick wide open the doors of their thinking, of their hearts, and overwhelm them, God. Overwhelm them by your goodness, your stability, your faithfulness, your consistency, your power, your history. We pray, Father, that every ounce of anxiety would be lifted in the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that our eyes can be fixed on you. We pray, God, for those who are looking just to figure this thing out between them, and they're anxious, maybe sitting at home right now, sitting right here in this room. They're even anxious about, I don't know even if I can have a relationship with God. And you demolish that, God, by the demonstration of your deep love for us in Jesus Christ on the cross where you exhibited, Father, this just this profound measure, this profound demonstration of what you think of us, that God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. Oh God, may you bring peace into the hearts of those that are looking for you today. Perhaps you're again, you're at home. Maybe you're at work. Maybe you're in your car. Maybe you're sitting in this room. Do you have peace with God? Will you lay your head down on the pillow tonight and be completely at rest between you and God. If you don't, and if you say, no, I'm not, that's not me, God has made a way. If God would have said to you, be more religious, more anxiety. Be better, change all your behavior in order to come me, more anxiety. But God said, let me relieve that anxiety. Let me come to you. It's exactly what he did in Jesus Christ. I come to you. I lay my life down for you. I pay your penalty of sin on the cross so that you can come. Jesus said, all you are weary, all you that are anxious, all you that are heavy with the things you carry, come to me and I will give you rest. Perhaps you don't have peace with God because you haven't gotten yet the peace of God. Listen, if that's you, speak to him right now. Here's how the conversation begins. God, I need you. It's so, it seems so simple that we can trip over. God, I need you. In fact, I need a savior. I need a rescuer. I am broken. I am perfect. And I'm asking God for a rescuer, savior. I can't save myself. I can't become more religious. I can't become more spiritual. I can't become change and be okay with you, God. I need Jesus Christ. And that's where I would go second. A lot of things to trust in. Don't trust a pastor. Don't trust a priest. Don't trust the church. Don't trust a politician. Don't trust anything but Christ alone. I trust Christ alone for my salvation, for my save, my, my rescue. Would you say that to God? First of all, I need a savior. Second, God, I trust Christ alone, the only lamb of God who died to take away the sins of the world. Put your trust in him right now. Speak to him. God, I trust you. I'm not trusting anything or anybody else to be right with you. I'm trusting you. And finally, you want a new life from God? Ask him. God, here's my life. I turn it in. It's like going to the store. I turn it in. I want an exchange. Would you bring 
new life in me. Would you bring me alive, God? Jesus calls it the second birth. Hey, there's no reason to play around with God. There's no reason to play a religious game. Speak to him. Be authentic. Be sincere. God, I need a savior. I trust in Christ alone. I'm asking you, God, for new life because you can have mine. Is that your prayer? This is the only place where you find that the intersection of Jesus is the only place you find the peace of God. So grateful, oh stable God, oh faithful God, oh powerful God, we end this day as we began in worship. We don't sometimes know what you're doing, but we know, God, you are right here, strong as ever. For that, Lord, we worship you in the name of Jesus.